You can turn in your copy of God's Word to Romans chapter 4. We'll be reading from Romans 4, verses 18 to Romans 5, verse 5. Um, Our particular attention will be from Romans 4, 22 to 5, verse 1. Uh, That'll be our particular text for this evening, but we'll read more for context. Uh, This message is titled, Resurrection Past, Present, and Future. Uh, But as I began working on speaking about the implications of the resurrection past and present and future, by the time I had finished the past, the sermon was uh, fully lengthy enough. (laughs) So we're just doing resurrection past today. Um, I thought I could preach about justification, sanctification, and glorification in one message, but I definitely could not. So uh, this is um, going to be resurrection past, implications of the resurrection um, in history for us today. Romans 4, starting in verse 18, let's give our attention to God's amazing, inspired word. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his face, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet, he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Therefore, Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he's given to us. Amen. Let's ask the Lord's help. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for a jam-packed, theologically rich passages like the one to which we are look, uh, things to which even angels would love to look into, these mysteries that were hidden for ages, but you've revealed them now to the saints. So Lord, we ask for your help as we seek to understand your word. We ask that you would illumine it to our hearts and minds, that your spirit would apply it to us and help us to truly see the glories of Jesus. And that as we behold his glory, we would be transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, when, we, when we look at the world around us, when we look at our own life, it's not too hard to see that there's a lot of problems. Uh, we have personal problems, relationship problems, health problems, and there's a lot of problems in society too. Uh, some of them seem rather new to us. Most are not. Sexual immorality, greed, theft, lying, murder, crime, broken homes, broken families. These things have always been with us. Um, it's easy to blame our problems on uh, those people the other people, the people out there who are ruining things. But it doesn't take very much sight, very much imagination to see uh, the problems in us, in our own homes, our own families, marriages, friendships, communities. And what's the source of all these problems? Uh, It's sin. We know that sin is really at the root of all the problems we face, both personal and external. And the deepest problem for us is not just that sin is out there, but that sin is in here. That's a deep problem for us. Uh, it's, a, it's a widely remarked quote, and it's not actually apparently been proven, so it might be legendary, but it's been said many times that um, a newspaper writer was asking different theologians and pastors uh, what they thought the biggest problem with the world was. 
There's many things you could imagine if there was a, a, a little survey to pastors. What's the biggest problem in the world? And uh, G.K. Chesterton was asked, and he just responded uh, with two words. To what is the biggest problem with the world? He said, I am. I am. He knew that sin within him is the first problem he needs to deal with. And this word sin, uh, sin is no longer a really real popular word in society. It conjures up all sorts of images for people. And I was actually reminded of a sad story um, that my aunt told me. Um, my, my aunt had been at a church for a while with a pastor for a number of years. And at some point that pastor, uh, he left and went on to other things and um, his, his theology began sliding. His practice and beliefs began getting unmoored from scripture. Um, which was sad, and she ended up seeing him years later, and um, he came to over to her house for some reason. I don't remember why, but they were having a conversation, and she mentioned something about, like, ah, oh, yeah, y y you know, just the problem is, the problems are sin, and he went, ugh, and she went, huh? He said, oh, don't say that word, and she went, sin? He goes, oh, yes, ugh, uh, don't say that word, and she was just so utterly flabbergasted that this person that had once been her pastor was at this point where he was saying, oh, uh, don't talk about sin. And this is uh, the posture of many in this world. They say, oh, why, why are you talking about sin? You just want to make people feel bad? Are you just trying to uh, point your finger and wag it in self-righteousness? Are you just having these puritanical scruples? They think sin is not something we should talk about. Um, one of the mid-century uh, prominent theologians in America was named Reinhold Niebuhr, and he's, he's remarked of as saying that um, if there's really one Christian doctrine that we have probably the most abundant evidence for, it's definitely the doctrine of sin. You don't really have to look very far to see the problems of sin all around us. Um, maybe the word for some has lost its meaning. Um, I read an article by Someone who was trying to describe for modern people, this was actually written to secular people in a city to say, um, what is this sin thing Christians have talked about for so long? And he kind of summarized the doctrine of sin this way. He just called it the human propensity to mess things up. The human propensity to just mess things up, to make a mess of it. We can think of that as original sin, our propensity to mess things up. And then actual sin we actually do mess things up. We mess up ourselves, our bodies, our minds. We mess up our relationships. And all this expands to mess up our communities, to mess up our country, to mess up our world. Even though the world doesn't like the word sin, everyone knows there's something wrong. There's something wrong with this world. There's something really broken about this world. Now, we see that uh, progressives and conservatives in society, they definitely disagree on what it is that's wrong with this world. But no one disagrees that there's something a matter. There's something that's been messed up by people. There's something broken. There's a moral cancer among us. And th the Christian contention is that this something that we know is wrong with the world is also something that's wrong with us. We are the individual parts that make up the whole of this mess. And the ultimate question we need to be asking is how can what's wrong with the world be made right? How can what's wrong with the world be made right? But the thing is, before we can actually answer that question, we need to answer a previous question, which is how can what's wrong with me be made right? How can what's wrong with me be made right? Because that's the answer. That's the ultimate answer. I've messed up, and I know it. You think, I've messed up and I know it, and I know that God knows it. And so what can be done for the likes of us? What can be done for the likes of us? T today I want us to see not just what can be done for the likes of us, but what has been done for the likes of us. How God intervened on behalf of messed up people and confirmed it in the resurrection of Jesus, the resurrection we celebrate this Easter Sunday. Because of Jesus, there is hope for you and me. And if there's hope for the likes of you and me, there's hope for this world as well. Hope for a broken and sinful world. 
We're looking at Romans chapter 4 tonight, and in the book of Romans, uh, Paul is talking to this church in Rome, a church made up of Jews and Gentiles, and he begins by reminding them in Romans chapter 1 of the flagrant sins that abounded in Roman society, this secular world, this Roman world. He writes how God gave them over to sinful desires, and he lists a lot of these sins that the people would see and they know are very sinful. But he doesn't stop there. In chapter 2, he knows that there's maybe a response to this as a lot of the good Jews in the church, the ones who grew up uh, attending synagogue every Sabbath, the ones that weren't partaking of these sins that they saw the Romans doing, um, they're thinking that this doesn't apply to them. They're thinking that they're off the hook. And so even though he's seen the Gentile world condemned in chapter 1, he turns to the Jewish, the God-fearing world and says, you guys are not left out of this. He says, yes, you've maybe not done those things, but you have covetousness in your heart. You have self-righteousness abounding within you. And he says, you're in the same boat. If I was to summarize Paul in that way, you're in the same boat. You're in the same plight. You, you want to take the log out of the eye. You have a speck in yours that needs to be dealt with as well. And so if he's going to summarize, he's convincing the Gentiles of their sin, but he's also convincing the Jews of their sin. And so Paul reaches his vital conclusion in Romans 3, verse 9. He says, Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. Churchgoers and non-churchgoers. Uh, the people that seem good and the people that seem not so good, all alike are under the power of sin. Or as he says later, there's none righteous. No, not one. All need God to put things right. Because no one is righteous enough to merit salvation on their own terms. And so, God needs to intervene. And God intervenes by sending his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're told in Romans 3, verses 21 to 25, that now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. This is a really jam-packed paragraph. And in it, we see a few really key concepts. In verse 22, we read that righteousness is given through faith in Jesus. Righteousness is meaning um, a right standing before God, that God can look upon someone and say, you are in the right. Now we know that everything's gone wrong. We know that we're messed up. So this righteousness, it is given to us by faith, not something we've earned, but somehow we get right standing with God. Righteousness, that's amazing. So the next key point is in verse 24, he says they are justified freely by grace. So we have to connect this idea of righteousness to an idea of justification. Okay, so justification, you could think of it maybe even as vindication. That someone who's been justified is someone who has been acquitted. Someone who has been pardoned and freed and released from this sense of guilt. So we have righteousness, and because they are considered righteous, they can be justified and vindicated. And the justification comes by grace. That is, it's God's gift to someone, not something they deserved or earned. And the mechanism by which this is accomplished, we see in verse 25. It says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Um, a more literal rending would be that he was a propitiation. That is, Christ's shedding of his blood pays the debt of sin, pays for the sins of his people, and so satisfies God's wrath so that God's smile can be upon these people that are now seen as righteous and just because Christ's blood is shed on their behalf. And it says this is received by faith. You don't work your way up to it. You don't good yourself enough to earn it. 
it's received by faith. And so we have a simple answer to our first question of how can a wrongdoer, someone who messes up all the time, be in the right before God? Because Jesus' righteousness is, we use this word, imputed to them. It is credited to them. It is counted to them so that this wrongdoer is now seen like Jesus as a right doer. And therefore they are justified. Because Christ not only pays the debts of sinners, but he credits righteousness to their account. Um, you could imagine, maybe you know, uh, imagine um, some young person you know, and maybe they've been very wasteful in their lifestyle, and they're racked with credit card debt, racked with student loans, racked with car loans, and they're just mired under mountains of debt. And they've decided they would love to live out the rest of their days in a gorgeous $20 million mansion on the sea. And you think, well, that's pretty impossible. Um, but then someone comes along and they say, um, I'm going to pay off all your debts. And all their debts are paid off. And so they go to the bank and they ask for the loan for the mansion. And they say, well, yeah, you don't have any debts anymore, but you don't have the income and the savings uh, to down pay this mansion or to pay it in really any way. Because you see, they don't just need their debts forgiven. They need a whole heap credited to their account. This is what Christ does for us. Not only does he pay our debt of sin, the debt we could never repay, but he credits all his righteousness into our account so that we can be recipients of the heavenly mansions he's preparing for us in glory for all eternity. It's not enough just to have our sins canceled. We need his righteousness given to us so that through him, he's paid for all, for all eternity. Received through simple faith, received like a gift, and really, we know in Ephesians 2 that even our faith is a gift from God, which is even more astounding. Received by faith. But in order to more enforce to his readers that this really is the way it works, this is not too good to be true, that really it's just faith that receives all this from Christ. I don't have to keep the law enough. I don't have to go to church enough. I don't have to be pure enough. They're like, that doesn't, that seems too good to be true. So he goes back and says, okay, remember your favorite person, Abraham? He's the father of the Jewish people, okay? Let's see how this worked in Abraham's life because it's not the law keeping that merited the righteousness. So he talks in Romans 4 about Abraham. And he says, Abraham, he was good as dead. He was 100 years old. His wife was 90 years old. They weren't having any kids. But God said, you're gonna be the father of many nations. God gave him a promise you're gonna have children as the stars of the sky. Now that's a pretty unbelievable claim. That's pretty against science and normal human conventions. But because God spoke, Abraham believed God. He believed that when God talks, he's telling the truth. Abraham believed God, and in Romans 4 verse 3, it says that Abraham believed God, and it's quoting Genesis here, and it was credited to him as righteousness. The simple belief in the word of God, the voice of God, the truth telling of God, it got credited to his account and it filled up his account with righteousness. Not righteousness that he had done and earned, but righteousness given him by God as a gift for believing his words. And so then later in verse 23, Paul tells the church what this means for them. He says in verse 23, the words it was credited to him it wasn't written for Abraham alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. We too have a word from God to believe like Abraham. Not the word that we're gonna have, uh, we're ourselves gonna be the fathers of many nations. No, the word we're given to believe is the promise of the gospel, forgiveness and grace through Jesus Christ. To whom does it say in this text, God will credit righteousness? Who gets this righteousness of God? It doesn't say it's those who go to church. It's not those who raise a family of upstanding citizens. It's not those who saved themselves for marriage. It's not those who give lots of money to charity. It's not those who can recite the Westminster Shorter Catechism. No, it says it's given to those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Many good things we could do, many good works we could do, but none of them get us righteousness with God. 
None of them fill your account with righteousness except faith in Jesus, believing God's word. Faith in God. And here's the word, uh, the vision we need to believe in Romans 4.25, that Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. That's the gospel good news. That's the work that God has done for us in Jesus. He died for our sins to deal with our sin problem, and he was raised to life to see us justified and vindicated before God. Here's why the resurrection of Jesus is important. And we talked about this a little bit when we looked at Acts 2. Uh, Because Jesus made lots of claims in his life. Jesus said he was the son of God. He said that he and the father were one. He said that he was the light of the world. He said he was Israel's Messiah. He said he would die and rise after three days. But how are the people that followed him to know that these claims were not spurious? How do they know that he was not just uh, someone saying things? And yes, he did miracles, but you know, there could be trickery or different things in this world. How were they to know that the claims were not spurious? Um, Have you ever had an experience where something didn't live up to its claims, right? Where something uh, over-promised and under-delivered? I I don't know if this was a big deal here, but uh, back maybe 15 years ago, there was a big thing going around some of our circles called Monavi. It was this juice. And it was said to me that this juice would solve all your problems. The juice would give you good sleep. The juice would lower your cholesterol, your blood pressure. It would prevent cancer. It would probably even help you grow an extra couple inches. This juice did it all. And this juice definitely over-promised and under-delivered. Uh, not to mention how the business opportunity overpromised and underdelivered as well, but overpromised and underdelivered. The claims were spurious. Or, um, you know, if someone's in a position where they write a check and they're saying, I have this money in my account that I will give to you. But then sometimes, sadly, uh, they do not have the money in their account and the check bounces. I remember uh, my dad used to teach actually still does. He teaches voice lessons, and he's a very good voice lesson teacher, so he, he charges a pretty penny for these voice lessons, and there was a young lady taking some voice lessons one time, and I, I remember overhearing um, out the door, because it was at our home, um, her saying, oh, have you cashed that check yet? And he said, yes. She said, oh, it's going to bounce. I'll write you another one. And, you know, maybe this young lady probably couldn't afford my dad's expensive voice lessons, but she had this confidence that she could pay for something she really couldn't pay for. Um, No, no, I I have what it takes. I can pay for the voice lessons. Uh, But the proof is that you actually can't because the check bounced. The people of Israel, they saw Jesus' miracles, they heard his teachings, and they believed he was going to overthrow Roman occupation, that he would overthrow the tyrannical government and set up Israel once again as a righteous nation to self-rule, to be its own political empire that could practice right worship, right teaching, and right belief. But instead, Jesus is condemned as a Jewish insurrectionist and is put to death by the same tyrannical government they thought he was going to overthrow. He's humiliated, crucified, shamely. It appeared to be a pretty grave failure, a pretty grave failure for the Jewish people. And so people abandoned him. Even a lot of his close followers abandoned Jesus. Considering his cultural project a failure, he overpromised at least what they thought he was promising, and under-delivered. He did not have enough. He didn't have what it takes to actually do what Israel wanted, set up a new Israeli state. But God did not abandon Jesus. David said he didn't abandon his soul to the grave. He didn't leave him there because Jesus did not fail at God's plan. The people misunderstood it. He was not coming to overthrow Roman rule. He was not coming to deal with the problem of the Roman government. He was coming to deal with a much, much greater problem, the problem at the root of all the other problems, which was Israel's sin. Their problem was not that they weren't in charge anymore, that they weren't the king. Their problem was that they have sin knocking at the door, crouching at the door always, ready to have them, ready to pull them back into idolatry, ready to pull them into lust and envy and greed and selfishness and tearing themselves apart. God's plan was much deeper than what the people knew, was much greater. 
And Jesus, the check of Jesus, he didn't bounce. He didn't overpromise and undeliver. But God, in raising him from the dead, set his seal of divine approval on him and is marking Jesus' work that it all is paid in full. The debt of sin, God looks at Jesus' race and says, paid in full. The debt of sin is paid because Jesus rose from the dead. We know death itself was conquered because it was impossible for death to hold him. We know that the powers of hell were vanquished because Jesus led captivity captive. And we know that he is God's chosen Messiah, his prophet, final priest, and eternal king because God raised him up by his power. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. He died to pay for sin that we might die to sin. He was raised to life that we might walk in newness of life and gain right standing before God. Because Jesus can stand in God's presence, we too in Christ can stand in God's presence. Here's what the resurrection means for you and me in our everyday mess, our everyday mess of life. If you've felt the weight of a guilty conscience, if you've felt the burden of your own shortcomings, uh, the shame of your own failures, where you know you've wronged people, you haven't honored God as you ought, you know you definitely haven't loved God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you know you definitely haven't loved your neighbor as yourself, and you think, what can be done for such as I? What can be done for the likes of me? My debt of wrong is great. I've, re I've really hurt others. I've really dishonored God. But Jesus' death is more than enough for every stain of sin, every drop of guilt. He rises from the dead and God says, paid in full. Paid in full to all who will believe. It's for you to open your hands and receive the gift of of Christ's righteousness and forgiveness. You can't earn it, and you do not deserve it. That's why it's of grace, not of works. But believe it, and you will receive it. That sounds so crazy. That sounds like something that those crazy preachers say where they say, just believe that your bank account will be full, and tomorrow when you wake up, your bank account will be full. It's not wish fulfillment. If you believe confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what God's promise in the scriptures says. God doesn't give empty promises. He says in John 6, 37, that the one who comes to me, I will be by no means cast out. We believe the promise of God like Abraham did. And so today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Don't harden your hearts, but believe like Abraham that through faith in the atoning death and victorious resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, you can come boldly to the throne of God's grace, be found to be right with God and Jesus, and find help for your time of need. Righteousness, justification, that in Christ we can stand acquitted in God's presence. And what's the end of it all? Why this justification? What is the end? What's the purpose of God justifying us and making us righteous? Is it just to bring us back into a level playing field and say, okay, phew, you guys are all good? No. Romans 5, 1. I think this is one of the greatest verses in all scripture. Therefore, okay, connecting directly with the death and resurrection of Christ. Why the death and resurrection of Christ? Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The end of justification is unto peace with God. That's the one thing no one has apart from Jesus. Peace with God. What's another word for peace with God? Uh, one of Paul's favorites, reconciliation. Being in reconciled relationship. He uses this term um, just in verse 10 of Romans 5. He says, if we were God's enemies... Um, if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? You see, enemies of God, they're at war with God, not at peace. And war with God leaves you exhausted and broken down. You can't fight God. Natural man is at en enmity with God. It does not submit to his law. And that's why everything is messed up. 
We don't follow God's ways, we follow our, our ways. Being at war with the designer of the universe means we always lose. And that's what sin is. It's saying, I know best what will make me happy. And so people fight. You fight to hoard your wealth, not knowing that true joy is found in generosity. You fight to hold on to your bitter grudges, not knowing that forgiveness leads to freedom. You fight to indulge in your sexual desires, not knowing that the power and beauty of sexual expression is best discovered in a faithful marriage between a man and a woman. You fight to manipulate and lie to get others to do what you want, not knowing that your happiest relationships will come when there is honesty and truthfulness and love. To be at peace with God means you've laid down your arms and surrendered to his rule, saying, Jesus, you make the rules, because I make terrible rules, and I make a mess of things. So you, you lead me, you guide me. Peace with God is more than simply ending your rebellion and submitting to him. Reconciliation means being brought into amiable relationship with God. And it's not until chapter 8 that Paul unveils what is the final fruition of what peace with God really means. But he tells us in Romans 8, 15, that the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. This is what the fullness of peace with God means. This is what justification is unto. Adoption. Being welcomed into the very family of God. Being invited to sit and sup with the king of the universe around his very table. It means that this God we once fought against, whose law we broke, whose rule we, we rebelled against, is the God we now get to call in Christ, Father. Father. How does a rebel become a son? through the redemption that's in Jesus, who was delivered up for our offenses and raised for our justification, so that now we have peace with God, the God whose love is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit he's given to us. And my friends, this is how what's wrong with the world can be made right. God is beginning his putting right project in us, turning enemies into his friends, paying their debts, forgiving their sins, granting them Jesus' righteousness, looking on them with eternal love and favor. This is the gift we get to remember this Easter Sunday. Peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, who was delivered up for our offenses and raised for our justification. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, these gifts of love divine are um, immeasurable, unfathomable, incomprehensible. We want to know this unknowable love of Christ, the love of Christ that passes knowledge. We long to be filled with the fullness of God. Lord, where we feel mired in our sins, where we feel afflicted in our consciences, help us to look up, to look up, to look up, to look up at Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who fully satisfies all our debts and who lovingly gives us his very righteousness that we can stand boldly, we can come boldly to the throne of grace, knowing that in Christ you see us as holy and blameless and above reproach. Made your very sons and daughters. What kind of love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called sons of God. Lord, thank you for your great gifts. Help us to remember the wonder of what you've done for us in Jesus and to never forget, to look to you day by day, confessing our sins, seeing your smiling face, receiving of all your blessings. We pray this all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and rejoice in the Lord Jesus, singing of his life, death, and resurrection. Let us sing in Christ alone. alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song 
this cornerstone is solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still when striving cease my comforter my all in all here in the love of christ i stand people say, amen. You may be seated. God's been very generous to us in giving us Jesus, and so uh, one of the ways we get to express our generosity in return is by giving to the work of his kingdom, uh, the work of his putting right project in this world. And so we just want to be reminded once again that we don't pass the plate in the evenings to just continue to seek to be generous, supporting the mission of God in this world. And if you want to give uh, to the second offering, um, you can see some of the ways to do that there. It's to the Family Life Center. And if you want to know anything about the Family Life Center, you can ask uh, me or Julie or Steve and Lynn, who, who all have pretty intimate firsthand knowledge of working at that very wonderful organization. Um, just in prayer tonight, a couple things we're going to remember is our missions team in Rolling Forks, Mississippi, as well as Spring Fest. Um, so let's join our hearts together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you um, that you love us and all parts of us, and we can bring all our requests to you, even though we know um, our sin and we confess it and seek your forgiveness, yet many other aspects of our life and our world you love, and you call us to bring our requests to you. And so, Lord, we ask you our many different requests this evening. We think of our missions team down in Rolling Forks, and we pray that you will bless their ministry, their service, their labor of love shown physically and tangibly to those who need extra help and assistance, that you would give them just skill and quickness as they seek to build and to serve, and that as they seek to bless others, they would receive a blessing, um, receiving that blessing of being a giver and a servant, and that even maybe for some there, you would grant them a passion for mercy, a passion for ministering to those in need. And maybe in that group, Lord, you would even be raising up deacons in their midst, those that would love ministering uh, to body alongside the soul. 
Lord, we pray for safety in all their construction. We pray for safety in their travels home and pray that they will have an excitement and joy in service that continues into the future. Lord, we pray for Spring Fest this week and we ask that you will use just this humble ministry of this local church to make a difference in the lives of neighbors, neighbors that we maybe even don't know but are called to love and show your goodness towards and have um, and to serve them in ways we can. Lord, and even if some never darken the door of our church again, that you would be glorified as we let our light shine before men, that they would see our good works, and that they would come to glorify our Father who is in heaven. Lord, would you grant joy and strength to every volunteer, and especially Jerry as he's heading up that outreach. And Lord, would you draw um, unbelievers to you through this ministry? that you would grant them um, just an intrigue and an interest in what type of people serve in this way, and that they would come to find the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We pray for good weather and for a smooth running of events. Lord, on a day when often uh, families get together, Lord, we do thank you for the families that you've placed us in. And we thank you, Lord, that you set the solitary in families, and you provide a family in your church to the lonely and the forgotten. Lord, we thank you for where you have placed us in your providence and pray that we will serve well in all our different familial relationships, whether it's a brother to a sister, a sister to a brother, parents to children, children to parents, grandparents to grandchildren, all these different relationships, Lord. Help us to do our duties to one another in love. And Lord, help us to remember those without families and to bring them into ours, into the very family of God, knowing that you are a God who loves to set the solitary in families. Lord, we also remember as we think about salvation in Jesus, um, how many of us have loved ones we would deeply desire to come to find forgiveness in Christ. And so, Lord, we do pray for our unsaved loved ones, friends, family members, maybe ones who we've been praying for for many years. Lord, grant us that perseverance like that widow who called on the judge continually. Lord, help us not grow weary in doing good. Help us not grow weary in prayer. But, Lord, we ask that you will bring about conviction of sin and a sense of the knowledge of all the grace that's in store in Christ and that we will be able to one day rejoice in these lost coins being found, these lost sheep being brought into the fold. Lord, bring about salvation. Lord, we pray in our own midst that you will do a work among us, that you will, even in your week-by-week, week, um, simple, ordinary means of grace, be conforming us more and more to the image of Christ. But Lord, we would like to ask for your special blessing. We would like to ask for a special outpouring of your Spirit, a reviving in our midst. Lord, would you send revival fires here? Lord, would you fill us once again with the Holy Spirit? And even as, as the elders have led us to uh, seek for an, um, an extra intentional season of prayer, Lord, would you hear our humble cries? Would you respond to the longings of the hearts of your people to know God, that we must have more of God, that, we, that you must increase and we must decrease, that Christ must be magnified among us. And as we see so many pressures around us, Lord, we know we need the transforming power of your gospel. We know we need the abundant fruits of your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we ask that you will together cause us to hunger and thirst for righteousness, to hunger and thirst for your ways, to hunger and thirst for Jesus Christ, that you will make us to be in a season of fervency, that as your word says, we would be fervent in prayer, that we would fervently love one another, and that we would be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Thank you that Jesus is Lord of the church, and you've given him as head over all things to the church. Thank you for the confidence we can have in Jesus that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Christ, but the Lord of peace will soon crush Satan underneath our feet. Oh, Lord, we thank you for Jesus. Help us to walk in the victory of Christ and to walk in close fellowship with you all our days. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say,